already been there. We're asking, remember that Shiloh Bible Institute's 39th graduation service here at the church, 147 Griffith Avenue, Washington, Pennsylvania, celebrating the graduates from coming through the school. And then uh, the chicken and roast beef dinner is scheduled for... When's the dinner? <laughs> Friday, Friday, August 4th, 2023, at 6.30 p.m., amen? The cost per dinner is $26, and the student's dinner is free. Um, then we have the graduation service Saturday, August 5th at 2 o'clock here at the church. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is the, I'm the 38th annual graduation dinner. Hallelujah. God is faithful. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. The second uh, announcement we have is covered dish dinner after Sunday service is going to be on Sunday, July 30th. July 30th, Sunday service dinner. There's a sign-up sheet on the back of the table back there where the uh, CDs are. If you know what you want to bring, put it down and we'll cook around it. Make sure everything is there. You know, main course and desserts and all that good stuff. Um, then also, we'll also be collecting uh, donations to school supplies for the Indian Reservation Outreach led by Ed Shalanka and Global Reach Network. Donations are also accepted, so we will be collecting for the next two weeks for the mission trip in August. Amen? All right. Prayer requests. Bobby Clemens, as you know, has uh, his father passed away, went on to be with the Lord, so keep him in prayer. Keep his family in prayer. Um, Tony is away at work for work purposes. So pray that God gives her traveling mercies and a good successful trip and uh, good business. Pat Uhouse, as you can see, she's not here. She was up all night with pain, uh, fibromyalgia. Myalgia. I can't say that for some reason. Fibromyalgia. There you go. Um, Art is not here, as you can see. He has swollen legs and uh, he can hardly walk, it's painful, so keep him in prayer. Debbie Wojtek, uh, her sister Sue, her Sue, Debbie, Sue's sister Debbie, I can't even talk to that, is having bladder surgery, so keep her in prayer. Um, Jess's family, keep her, them in prayer. The Lord touched the heart, men broken hearts, and also for salvation. Lucy is going away. So pray that she has traveling mercies. Amen. That God protect the family as she's going off to Bible camp. Bible camp today after church. So keep them in prayer. Millie was trying to come in today. <coughs> Excuse me. Her legs are swollen and she's having difficulty walking. So keep her in prayer. And Bradley is, has MRSA. And Jesus' cousin Kathy is going through chemo and radiation. And Continue to keep Tony's voice in prayer. Praise the Lord. Crew is in the house. We had her on the prayer list last week. Amen. She's doing much better. She's walking. She's getting on. Amen. Keep Donna Molinero in prayer. She has medical things going on, so keep her in prayer. Amen. God take care of all that she needs. Continue to pray for Jason Stewart. Um, I spoke with his sister last week. His platelets and biopsy. He had done this past week. He's waiting for test results. He had both his lungs collapsed, and they're now open. So praise the Lord. Amen. His appetite is returning. So keep uh, Jason Stewart in prayer. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. All right. We're going to have... Yeah.
put it under the ground so the water goes through the pipe to the street. Well, my Mexican neighbor didn't do that, and he had a, what's it called, an extension that I had to do many extensions, and guess what's happening? The extension is short, and it's washing down the bank, the dirt, and now mud is going down our walk, and in the winter, we're going to deal with ice. I went up to him, I was real nice, and I said, Pablo, I don't know why you didn't put the pipe under the ground like Bill was telling you. He knows what he's talking about. He was going to help you for nothing. You didn't do it. And now look at this picture. Look at this. So his name's Pablo. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yes. My brother, Steve, he lives in Florida. Um, he, um, has been very, very sick for a couple months. He had his gallbladder removed, um, and he is back in the hospital requiring a surgery. Um, he's been he's been in the hospital now for about a month and a half. Um, he's very ill, but uh, hopefully the surgery will take care of any issues left over from the gallbladder problems he's had. Um, also, we heard um, over the weekend um, a lady had fallen through a porch. Um, I'm not sure of her name, but she has broken ribs and a collapsed lung. Um, so we'll keep her in prayer as well. Amen. Okay, Pastor Ed, come on up. Pastor Ed, come on up. Far, <laughs> come on up. Okay. <laughs> Scripture tells us to call on the elders of the church and to pray for them that they might be healed. And the word might is not that they may be healed, but that they will be. The might is call them as they are willing. Call them as they're believing. They will be healed. Amen? So you're going to stand in proxy of Pastor Ed, so I pray for you. I'm going to anoint you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father God, we just praise you and give you glory today. And Lord, we thank you yes. for your loving kindness and your grace and your mercy that you extend upon us. Thank you, God. And that, Lord, we know as you have said, we know, Lord, and we need you to experience this. If you said it, you're going to do it. Yes. And you said that is your will. Yes. So, Lord, we lift up to you these people here, Lord, that have been announced, that's been spoken of. We pray, Father God, that you would touch them, that you would heal, you would deliver, and you would set them free from every bondage, Lord. And, Lord, if there's anyone on the list or has been mentioned, if they're not saved, bring them into the kingdom of God. Yes. They'd be totally be whole in Jesus' name, spiritually, mentally, and physically. Yes. And we give Thank you me. all glory and all honor. And we believe in the Lord. Yes. It's done because you said it is done. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Pastor. Praise Jesus. Amen. Amen. God is so good. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. No matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're going through, your God is still good. Because God is love. And love is unconditional. And his love is perfect. Amen. Hallelujah. There's no variation in God's love and his attentive care in us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. Amen. All right. As you can see, our worship team's not here all together, so I'm going to help my wife with the worship. So we'll have her come up now. Amen. 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 Yes, indeed. Celebrate Jesus. Amen. Lights on. Lights on. 
that's on somebody's home. Yeah. You're going to be looking at the lights. Yeah. <laughs> Are you paying attention? What is the light? <laughs>
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being that light. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord. Thank you. 
just how good our God is. Amen? Yeah. Our God is so good. Hallelujah. Amen? There is not a one, nothing to compare for the love of God. Amen? He loves you unconditionally. He knows where you have been. He knows where you're going. He knows what has happened. He knows what's going to happen. Your God is very intuitive of what's going on in your life. God loves you that interesting. Intricately, I can't say that closely, that even should a sparrow fall from the sky, the word of God says he knows of it. How much more does he care for you? Amen? Amen. Somebody give God some praise this morning. We're going to continue in our love gift unto God by bringing up our tithes and our offerings unto the Lord. And as you know, it goes toward the ministry and the bills of the church. Hallelujah. God takes care of his own. Amen? Amen. 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 He says, give with a grateful heart, a cheerful heart, and that which you have be given shall be returned unto you. Shaken together, piling it in together, solid, and it be run over. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Majesty, worship his majesty unto all glory, honor, and praise, majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem reigns, so They've given their hearts to the Lord. Amen. Wow. Given their lives unto God. Amen. They dedicate their life to the Lord and they're asking God to bless them and keep them safe and to pray for the unborn child. Hallelujah. May God bless them with a child. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the lives of these two young girls, God, that you have put upon the heart of the people to pray for them, to lift them up, to encourage them. Lord, remind them that we are now family with them, Father God, and if anything that affects them affects us, we are one in Christ Jesus. 
And Lord, we welcome a newborn child that you have blessed us with, Father God, into the family of God. And we ask, Lord, that you just keep your hands on these two, raise them up in the admonition of the Lord, glorifying you, Father God, through their lives. May they be a living testimony unto Jesus Christ of all people who come to know them and show the love of God through their lives. In Jesus' name we praise you, Father. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody say in this, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm just making note that Michael is the dad. He Why? Come you should have come up with us. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. The children, if they haven't already, are welcome to go down to the children's ministry downstairs. Amen. Praise the Lord for the children. Amen. God says, in the mouth of babes shall lead them. Hallelujah. Amen. You have your Bibles with you this morning. I want you to go to Ch Genesis chapter 2. We'll be actually working through Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Just touching on base on it. I, For you don't take her and just get your pen and paper ready and jot down real quick. I will be going through some scriptures rather quickly. If you need to repeat it, just raise your hand and I'll know what that means. And I'll repeat it for you. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Father God, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us the word today. I thank you for putting upon my heart the word which you would have the people to hear. I pray, Father God, that your word will go forth and accomplish what it's set out to do. Not returning empty or void, but accomplishing, Father, to change the hearts and the minds of people. Give them the present view of who you will say we are and where you are taking and leading us to. In Jesus' name we give thanks. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, you know, takers, this morning's message is called, I Can Only Imagine. Hallelujah. I Can Only Imagine. There's a song sung by Mercy Me, and it's called, I Can Only Imagine. And it talks about what your eyes will see when God sees you face to face. And as I heard it on the radio after leaving the restaurant with all of us last Sunday, I realized that we'll all one day take our last breath on this earth. And when we open our eyes, we'll be standing in eternity. Somebody say amen. amen. We'll be standing before the Son of God, Almighty God. Can you imagine? The word time came to mind. And sometimes we love that time goes slow, don't we? Sometimes we love time goes fast. When I'm at work, I'm like, man, I wish time would pick up and go a little faster. And when I'm home, I'm thinking, man, I wish time would slow down. i got to go to work in the morning. <laughs> it's like, come on. You see, like time is not on our side. Huh? The word time, time kept coming to me this week. When will this day begin? When will this day end? When is this going to happen? When is that going to happen? But either way you're thinking, whether you like time to go quickly, whether you like time to go slowly, we all know that this day will end. Amen? Amen. Either way, there is an ending up ahead. Every good book has an ending. Every good movie, every good song, every good meal, every good moment in life has an ending. And yes, every person's life as we know it will end. As I was thinking of the words from a buddy of mine, I reflected on my age this week. Don't need it. <laughs> it came very clear just how short our time on earth is. When we are at, in our adolescent years, Time has no real meaning, no real value, no real effect on us because we play with our friends or toys and we then eat and sleep and start the day over again the next morning. We really don't think about time. Then, like the slow moving train for the teenager, amen? The roller coaster of feelings and emotions, the, the experiences of life, the trials and tribulations have just hit the stage of puberty. Now real life begins. Anybody there ever feel that? Yeah, your emotions are all over the map, right? <laughs> we eat, we sleep, and we start the day again. Life is slow moving, and the child's dreams and the fantasies are waiting to be explored, whether you're a teen or whether you're an adolescent. Our teenage years, well, time seems to be a little quicker. With middle school, high school brings the events of the seasons, life with both excitement with anxiousness, anticipation, and a wonder. And without its roller coasters, hormonal growth, it really is a challenge. But time is captivating in creating memories, hope for a future, and a drive to move forward, and a gain of independence. That is a teenager. 
In our 20s, it would seem that we reevaluate life, seek more and strive to become successful, to find love, to fulfill the prosperity dream. And one day, while sitting at the dinner table with family and friends, as we did last Sunday, a conversation begins. Or at a birthday party, a wedding, a funeral, or even at the birth of a child, a thought comes to our mind. Wow, just how time flies. Amen? How time has gone by. I can't believe how time has passed. And as I reflect on my life, I realize that life on this earth is but a blink, just as the scripture says. We are a blade of grass here today and with her tomorrow. My wife and I have a sweet baby girl. We have a new family about to have a sweet baby. And she's not a baby anymore. She is a mature, grown woman with a husband and a baby boy of her own. And as I walked into their home, the babysit Aaron's son, Austin, my grandson, the very next Monday, I went home thinking, wow, my heart is full. My heart is full. We have a child in heaven. We had a child that was born premature and we lost it. But we have another child that God promised and her name is Eric. And I was overwhelmed at the thoughts of just how fast time is gone. Now, I don't know about you guys, but as time gets so caught up, I get caught up in the living. Huh? You get so caught up in the living that you fail to, as the expression goes, stop and smell the roses. You get so caught up in working, living, providing for your family, doing what the necessity of life calls for, that you rarely take time to look at the blessings God has given you. This week, I looked back at the blessings. I went to my favorite fishing spot, the pond down there by the lake where I used to live. And I thought about what life has for me, what, where we are, what's headed, what we're going to look at. And I have to say, the blessings don't measure any hardship, any difficulty. My bud, Pastor Ed, upon wishing a couple of friends a happy birthday last Sunday, he jokingly jested about my age. And as I laughed and grabbed him back, he stated joyfully, I might add, that he doesn't concern himself with age. He sees the senior year simply as time that is getting closer to go home to be with Jesus. I kind of welled up in a minute. I had to look away. I didn't want to look at him. And I had tears in my eyes, sort of, and I had to quickly get myself in check. And after a restaurant trip getting home, relaxing on my couch, I wondered about his words. I pondered about them. And I reached for my Bible, kind of sad at his words, realizing just how much I miss him and how he has had a life-changing effect on me. And as I thought of these words, he spoke, he said, it just means that I'm getting closer to going home to be with Jesus. And it kept coming at me, those words. And Holy Spirit prompted me to reach for my Bible, and I opened it up to Psalm 144, verse 4. I'm going to ask you to open your word today. The Psalm 144, verse 4, holding your finger in Genesis chapter 2. Psalm 144, verse 4. When you have it, say amen. Psalm 144, dot, dot, 4, 4. Amen. Amen. Psalm 144, verse 4 says, Man is like to vanity, which means a breath. So we'll say this. Man is like a breath. His days are as a shadow that passes away. Wow. And I heard myself say aloud, Well, Lord, jeez, that thought didn't lift my spirits any. You're just reminding me that I'm here but a minute and I'm going. Life is just now good for me, Lord. I'm where I need to be in life. I have a beautiful family. My wife and I are solid. I have a brand new grandson, five years old, coming up in the world. He loves Jesus. It's just awesome. I'm loving life. And you're reminding me that life is but a breath. It's gone in a minute. And then he had me look to another. And this time my Bible reading led me to Psalm 39, 5. You have your Bibles already in Psalm. Put back to Psalm chapter 39, verse 5. Psalm 39, verse 5. The Lord had me open it up, and this is what he said to me through his word. I became you, meaning I could not speak. I became you and still. From good I was sung, and my pain was stirred. My heart was hot within me. While the fire burned, I was meditating. I spoke with my tongue. Oh, Lord, 
Make me to know my end and the limit of my days, what it is. Let me know how I am lacking. Behold, like a handbreadth, you gave my days. Even my life was non-existent before you. Amen. Again, I was like, Lord, what is this you're trying to tell me? What, what am I going to understand out of this? I'm not feeling very joyful right now. <laughs> and this thought, God opened my Bible to Acts chapter 17, verse 22 through 28. Flipping over to Acts 17, 22 through 28. I'm doing exactly what the Lord did to me to you. One scripture after the other he led me to. Acts chapter 17, verse 22 through 28. Say amen when you got it. Amen. Acts 17. 22 through 28. It reads, Standing in the middle of the Aparagus, Paul said, Men of Athens, I see in everything how God-fearing you are. For passing through and looking up at the objects of your worship, I also found an altar on which had been written to an unknown God. Not knowing then whom you worship, I make it known to you. To God who made the world and all things in it, one being Lord of heaven and of earth, does not dwell in handmade temples, nor is served by hands of men as having need of anything. For he is giving light and breath and all things to all. I underlined that in my Bible. For he is giving light and breath and all things to all. And he made every nation of men of one blood to live on the face of the earth, ordained Four appointed seasons and boundaries of their dwelling to seek the Lord, if perhaps they might feel after him and might find him. Though indeed he not being far from each of us, for in him we live and move and exist, as also some of the poets among you have said, for we are also his offspring. Somebody say amen. 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 In Christ Jesus, we live, we move, we have our being. And that is where, as I thought of these words I was reading, I realized that we all take our last breath on this earth. And as our last breath on earth ends, our first breath in life really begins. The life of eternity. That moment that we stand before an almighty God. And I realized more and more, before the measurement of how life is measured, I realized just how important you and I are to God. How important we are. And as we shared, we, as a sparrow falls from the sky, how much more does God care for you? Amen? I always look for nature to speak to me, for God to speak to me through nature. For I listen to you when you share your story. I listen to a sermon. I listen to, I'm always intuitive, which means I really pay attention. I'm expecting to hear from God all the time. That's a relationship. Just as you have with one another, just as you have with your spouse, just what you have with your best friend. I'm listening to what you have to say. I'm having a conversation. And as I was putting this message together, I was at work, and I am in charge of the fish pond out there out of work where there's a picnic area and a, an activity outing for the residents where I work. And as I was going out there to check the fish pond, because I know that moss and all that yucky stuff grows in a hot summer, so I have to clear out the water randomly, and so I looked to investigate how long I needed to get out there and clean this water pond out for the fish to survive. And there was a dove caught in the corridor of the building that was stuck and didn't find himself out. All four walls is made of glass, and he just sees his reflection. And he was struggling to get out. And I reached up, and I grabbed a hold of the dove, and he got away, and he took, bolted through the window and smacked. And something that I really was trying to avoid happened. Yeah, he died. As I had him in my hand, I was like, Lord, I tried so hard to save him. It's so hot in here. I knew he wouldn't survive in here very long. And the doors won't open for him. They're automatic doors when they see a person that automatically opens. This thing is not going to have the doors open. He's going to die. And yet he died anyway. Lord, bring him back to life. And as the bird was gasping for air, his eyes closed, and I realized he's not with us. And my heart was saddened, and I was like, Lord, how this has happened. I did what I needed to do to help this bird, and he really was just against everything I did to try to get him to save me, try to give him his freedom. And the Lord said, 
This is how many of my people view my interaction with them in life. Sometimes God's direction, sometimes his word may seem harsh to you, may not be understood by you, but God is always for your good. He's always looking to get you into a relationship, into a place, into a setting that he has a purpose, a plan, and a future for you. And that purpose, plan, and a future is one day to bring you home into the glory of heaven, to be with him for all eternity. Somebody say amen. 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 Sometimes I, I, I listen to the folks that I work with. I listen to you all. And I've heard different things today. That's one of the areas that God said, okay, this goes into the message. And another thing that someone said to me, and they said, well, they said, Pastor Bob, how do you know there's life after death? And I said, by faith. And they said, what do you mean by faith? I said, you have to believe that Jesus said there's life after death. Jesus said that on the pond of the cross, before he got to the cross, he met with his disciples. He met with the people that loved him. And he said, do not fear. Don't become anxious. Don't worry about it. I'm telling you what is about to happen, but I have to tell you what's going to happen so that you know why it has to happen and what the purpose is for it to be. And basically, he was saying, don't fear. Don't be anxious. Don't concern yourself with where I'm going, what I'm doing. I have to go because if I'm going, I'm going to my father's house. I'm preparing a place for you. And if it were not so, I would not have told you that. Jesus has a purpose, plan, and a future for you. And then people this week also said, well, best of all, why did babies get sick and die? You lost an unborn child and it died. Is that the curse? Did you do something? Is God punishing you? Did God just want the, the baby die? Did the enemy take the baby? I said, we live in a cursed sin world. We don't have control of what goes on other than trusting and believing that God will work all things out. Whatever the devil meant for your evil, God will turn it around and use it for your good. Amen. And the curse rests upon all of us. No, God does not have prejudice. There's no prejudice in sickness and disease either. Yeah. Sickness and disease doesn't care whether you're married, you're single, you're white, you're black, you're, yeah. you're Asian, you're old, you're young. It doesn't have a prejudice. The curse of sin rests upon generation after generation on all of us. And, well, you're a Christian man. You've got a Christian wife. You, you've dedicated your whole life to God. How did you lose your child? The curse of sin rests upon all of us. But God will turn it around for you. How does God turn around that you lost a baby? Something to be good. How do you see that as good? That baby's life is not ended. I have a child in heaven waiting to meet me. And I'm waiting to meet them. And I don't know whether it's a male or female. But I trust that this child is with God. And I'm going home one day. My child's already home. My wife and my daughter and I and my family, they are going to heaven to be introduced to our new child. Our child that God has blessed us with. You see what I'm saying? God says there is a future, a hope, and a plan for us. We have to trust and believe that his word is without error. There's no error. There's no wrong. There's no, there's no fake. There's no unreal. There's no untruth. It's all truth. Amen? Amen. As I realized this, and I put this message together, the Holy Spirit left me with a question. And as you know, if God's asking me something, and I'm pertaining to the message, I'm bringing it back to you. Well, if God asked me, I think he should ask you. So here it is. What is it that Jesus will see when he and I, when he and you meet face to face, what is it that Jesus will see? You see that song, I can only imagine, was asking, what will I see? Will I be able to stand in all of you? Will I be able to speak? Or will I lay prostrate before you, unable to move? I can only imagine what heaven has. I was going to play that song for you. I encourage you to look it up on Google. Mercy Me sings it. I can only imagine. It's a beautiful song about a guy. He lost his child. The child died and went to heaven. And he was so overwhelmed with losing the child that he sought God and he asked God, God, where is my child? What is it? What has happened and why? And God gave him a song in his heart. And he sang it. You've got to hear it. Mercy Me. I can only imagine. In that song that I was listening to this week as I went to the fish pond or the lake, 
where I used to live, God began to open our <coughs> eyes of my understanding, and he was explaining to me that we always need to remember just how short this life is, and that life has come out of only one way, and that is through him. He is the author, the finisher of your faith, but he's the creator. He is the father that gave you life. Amen. Amen. We need to keep our earthly minds heavenly bound. You know, no matter what you're going through in life, no matter what difficulty you must face, you have to remember this is temporary. You are heavenly bound. You are on a journey for a season. And at the end of that journey, at the end of that season, you're going to be home with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our purpose of living this life is only found in Jesus. And yes, he wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to rejoice in the work of our hands, the blessings that he gives us. But he also says, remember, there is a time on earth that will come to an end. And that time is coming. You're living in the latter days. Look around you. All the scripture speaks of what's going on in the world today. There are earthquakes that are not normal in places that are happening. There are fires that are happening that are burning up massive ground of forest that normally would not experience that type of fire. There is children rising up against the children, fathers and parents killing their children, the unborn. There is the homosexuality being accepted. The Bible says that in the latter days, man will call what is right wrong and what is wrong right. In the latter days, it says, the earth will tremble at the birthing pains of the last days to come. All of heaven will glorify God in those last days. And we, you and I, need to keep our eyes heavily focused. Amen? No matter what is going on around you, you have to know that God has a purpose, a plan, and a future. And whatever the devil meant for your evil, God will turn it around and use it for your good. Somebody say amen. 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 You see? Time. Time here on earth, we shall all return to our Heavenly Father who created us. And the Lord reminded me that man's life is like a breath. Our days are like a passing shadow. So make them count and live as God intended for you to live. Because when we hear that question from God, what did you do with my son Jesus? What did you do with my son Jesus? A decision would have already been made. Did you hear that? A decision. When Jesus asked you, what have you done with your life? What did you do with the Son, the Son of God, in your life? There has already has been a question that has been answered by your life, how you will spend eternity. And the realization hit me. The decisions we make today have eternal implications. Amen. Amen. Thankfully, I whispered back to God. I said, thank you, Lord, that I can answer that question in the present tense and not the past tense. Amen. When Jesus says, what did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? Did you believe in him? Did you follow after his examples? Did you love as Jesus loved? I could say, yes, I did. <laughs> Little late in life, but yes, I did. I got my thinking right. I got my heart right. I gave my life to God. And I decided I will follow him no matter no one else follow. I'm going to follow him. No matter what it costs, I will give away the things of the world that you have blessed me with God. I will give that thing which I cared most about because I love you foremost. And if it costs me everything, I will follow you. Amen? If God asked me only when I was standing in front of him, I'd be terrified. But God is asking us now, in the present tense, where is your heart for my son Jesus Christ? What will you see when you get into heaven? I have no chance to reevaluate, to consider, to change anything once I'm standing before the living God after my earthly death. Amen? My life on earth has ended, and now I stand before a holy God, and he asks me, what have you done with my son, Jesus Christ? Questions flooded my mind at this point, but the important ones were this. Have you received Jesus? the Son of God, as your Lord and Savior. By receiving him is to mean learn of him, accept of him as the Son of God. Have you believed in him? Meaning, believe that he came to earth to reveal Heavenly Father and his love for mankind, to be crucified, taken upon himself the sins of the world, raised from the dead, cleansing man's heart and his conscience from sin and death. Do you believe that Jesus did this for you? And the question, are your sins washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Have you repented, committed your life to him, living your life while on this earth, obedient to the word of God, found in the Bible, being filled with the spirit of God? This thought uh, sent me into studying, studying for a message today. And as I was studying, the Lord put it on my heart to look at John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40. Turn your Bibles with me, please, to John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40. Jesus asked, have you received Jesus as the Son of God? Have you believed in him as your Savior, your Lord? And have your sins been washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb? And Jesus says these words in John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. The one coming to me will not at all hunger, and the one believing in me will not thirst, not ever. But I said to you that you also have seen me and did not believe. All that the Father gives to me shall come to me, and the one coming to me I will no way cast out. For I have come down out of heaven, not that I should do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I shall not lose any, but shall raise them up in the last day. And this is the will of the one sending me, that everyone seeing the Son and believing in him should have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, I'm not preaching a gloom and doom message this morning, but at the same time, I'm obedient to give my flock, which God has entrusted me, the truth and the realization of our, what our Bible teaches about where we are headed, what is happening in our life, and what is the promise at the end of our days? So again, this is not a gloom and doom message, but an awakening, a hopeful message. For the Christian, there's nothing to be afraid of. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 eight that we can be confident of this very thing. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Somebody say that with me. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8. At this point is where the Lord reminded me of Pastor Ed's words again. And the Lord then reminded me that our last breath here is our first breath in eternity. Somebody say amen. amen. John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3. John chapter 14 verses 1 through 3. It reads, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Jesus is saying, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, but if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. My wife touched on it. As I share with you, I don't tell her my message. I simply give her a title and let the Lord lead her in the worship. And as I touched on it, I thought about what she said up here this morning because I also added those words that, you know, people think that when you die, you're going to go to heaven and you become an angel. That is not true. That is not found in the scripture. In fact, it says that quite the opposite. You see that angels are told exactly what to do and how to do it and they don't have thought for themselves. You have a free will. You were set above the angels. You are more valuable, more precious than anything that is in heaven. You are the creation of God. You have an image and a likeness after your father. The angels are created beings that to be angels. Nothing more. And they have nothing else other than what they have presently. You have a present, a future, a plan that is different than any creation that God has created. You are a being in your own identity. You are not going to become an angel. Somebody say amen. amen. You have questions and you have concerns. You have doubts of believing that. See me after and I'll show you scripture. You are not going to be an angel. You do not go to heaven, die, and hover over this earth and watch after us when you're gone. When you're gone. You have no power. You have no life existence on this earth. You do not become a ghost. You're not floating somewhere and going, Ooh, to the people that give their hearts out of life. And you're not blessing them and letting them know that you're here by knocking something off the shelf. You are not an angel. You are not a ghost. 
You are a child of God. You are a creation, a created being that is made after the image, after the likeness of your heavenly Father. Somebody say amen. amen. So at this point, God reminded me that you and I are the children of God and there is no death in Jesus. Now think about that. If you were a ghost, what do people say about the ghost? I see dead people. Huh? <laughs> I see dead people. What do you, you're dead. There's no death in Jesus. Jesus is all life. He's the giver of life. Amen? Amen. Our last breath here is our first breath in eternity. You're in heaven. The word of God says there's a great abyss between heaven and hell. That there is between. And some people believe that we live in between. Huh? We live in between. Some people call it purgatory. I gotta pay my dues before I go to heaven. I gotta make right what I did wrong. I gotta have people pray for me. I have people give the church money to get me into heaven. That's a lie of the devil right there. Huh? That gives you a license to live however you want to live, and then in heaven somebody's gonna break you out. You see? John chapter 14, verse 1 to 3, I want to read it again. Because, you know, some of these people that Jesus is talking about, some of these people are thinking the same thing that we're thinking. What's going to happen to me? Where are we going to be? Where are you going? I want to go where you going, but I don't know what's going to happen. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you. I am coming again. I will receive you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. Somebody say amen. Amen. In that moment, when we are face to face with God, all that hope we've been storing up in our heart becomes a reality. All of our faith that we've been maturing, becoming within the view of what God has called us to be, the man and the woman after God, we will look into the very eyes of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we will know that we have arrived. We are home. Amen? That's what my pastor friend, my brother in the Lord said. I am not concerned of how much time I have left. I'm more in the thought of, I'm going home. I'm going to see my Jesus. I'm going to see the ones that have gone before me and with him. We will have a great celebration. I'm not going to be thinking about you. I'm not going to knock on you the door and come down and say, Oh, uh, how are you doing? I know you missed me. You want to have a conversation? He can't do that. He's not going to do that. His heart, his whole being is going to be caught up with Jesus. There's going to be a great celebration. There's an ongoing of life for him. Amen? Amen? Amen. You realize there's over 200 people listening a little and you're here. I don't want to be by myself, right? Amen? Amen. 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 This is a prophetic word from Jesus. Hear it. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming again. Somebody say, I'm coming again. Amen. And I'll receive you to myself. Somebody say, I'll receive you to myself. I'll receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Today's message again is I can only imagine. This is will be our title. I can only imagine. I think that in today's world, many have lost sight of the promise that Jesus is coming back. Hello? We get so caught up in life, we get so caught up in providing for our families, loving those who love us, doing all that we can to make a good life for ourselves, that we forget that Jesus is coming back again one day. That our life will be but a vapor of smoke here today and gone tomorrow. We get so caught up in living that we fail to look to the future. The future where I'm going to be, not the future of the world. We know where the future of the world is going to rest, right? Not one stone will be stacked upon another. It will be desolate, laid flat. Everything this earth has of value to you will be gone in a vapor, in a smoke. Huh? You know that, right? Noah's ark was washed away into the world that was filled with nothing but water. And it was carried for days and days and days until God receded the waters and landed the ark on dry land and a new world has begun. The same is about to happen to this world, but by fire. Hello? This earth will eventually be burned away and a new earth will be given and Jesus will reign in the millennial year that he will be for a king of kings and the Lord of lords reigning in the new life for a thousand years. And all those things that believe in him that died before him will be caught up in the air and taken to his glory and God will establish his kingdom. Somebody say amen. Amen. You see, we have to get caught up in that 
vision of what we are in store for, where we're going, what's happening to our lives. I think, again, in today's world, we lost sight of that promise. And as I thought about time this whole month, God reminded me that time is of the essence, that life as we know it is going to change, and the signs of the time are revealing themselves even now. Look amongst you. Look in your neighborhood. Look into the world. Look at the world news. My wife hates to watch the news. Because why? It's so depressing. It's so bringing down your spirit. There's no future in it. Everything you hear is doom and gloom and bad things happening. Hello? God said be watchful. So that you know when the times come. Amen? As I was reading in the book of Acts, I found that in chapter 23 that the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they're very sad people. You know they're very religious people? How many of you know that very, very religious people are a bunch of sad people? Hello? <laughs> Think about it. They're so caught up in the religious rituals, the religious functions of the church, that they fail to realize that Jesus is a person. Jesus is a relationship. Jesus has a purpose, a future, and a plan. And the Sadducees and Pharisees, they didn't believe in Jesus as a future, the hope, and the plan. Amen? They said, you are not the Son of God. <laughs> They got so caught up in the Word that they were not seeing the Word was actually standing before them. Hello? I can only imagine what my eyes will see when I stand before God face to face. Amen? The Sadducees say that there's no resurrection, that there are neither angels nor spirits. The Pharisees believe all these things, but they didn't believe Jesus is the Messiah. And as I thought about these people, a really sad bunch, I thought these Sadducees and these Pharisees, they're the religious of the day. How about our pastors of today? How about our evangelistical me messengers today? How about the prophets? How about the teachers? How about the, the ones that are missionaries sending out there? What message are they teaching, preaching, giving about who this Jesus is? Amen. God is asking each of us this morning, who do you say this Jesus is? And what have you done with him in your life? Hello? Amen. Not as what did you do with him as if you put him on the shelf, but what are you living with? What are you doing for? What are you living with him as? You see? What value has he in your life? What changes is he making in your life? Why or how and when did you invite him into your heart? Yeah. And what did you do with him living with you? The Sadducees, Sadducees and the Pharisees, they're very religious as that they they, they may not have, the, all the acts, uh, have all the access of what we have today. The, the TVs, the radios, the Bible teachings, the schools, the colleges teaching the word of God to people. But they had Jesus in their presence, in their eyes. Hello? Yeah. Last week, if you recall, I talked about the five senses. Your eyes, your touch, your smell, your ear, your feeling, your, your, your taste. All of it can deceive you. But your heart is deceptive of all things. It's the most deceitful. But in Jesus, when he shows you the realness of who he is, all of your senses come alive. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus when you accept in him. Everything now becomes alive to you. You see? There's no death in Jesus. All of you, your whole being comes alive. And that's why people say, I'm excited. Jason, when he first accepted the Lord, he had gone to church with his mama for many years. May I share? And he said, I, Bob, he says, this is different than anything I've ever experienced. Mom always took me to church. You know, I went to church with you. I, I, I have friends that were Christians, and I would agree with everything. And I said, yeah, I'd even say an amen now and then. And I would sing the song. But nothing has touched my heart like it has this time. I know this Jesus is real. He lives on the inside of me. I was religious, but now I have a relationship with Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. That's what I'm talking about. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, they had religion, but they did not know this Jesus. This Jesus was in their presence, standing before them. And he was saying, I am the light, the way, and the truth. No man cometh unto me except through the Father. I'm standing here now giving you words of life, and you're rejecting me. You're saying I'm not who I am. And you're telling now the people that you're not who I am, not who you say that I am. You're telling them a lie. You're having them just fall into this deception. And then, whoa, is the blood on your head. Hello? That's what Acts 23 talks about. 
the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the very religions of that day. They had a visual and physical evidence of the truth of who this Jesus is. And then they faced the afterlife. Hello? That's what Jesus asked me. That's what Jesus is asking you. What did you do with this Jesus in your life? You see? And he will ask you that in your last breath. When you open your eyes into eternity, you're standing before God. Did you believe in this Jesus, my son? Did you believe that I sent him so that you would not die but have everlasting life? Did you believe that all that you have gone through in life, my son was there with you, walking, operating in the spirit of God to protect, to guide, to get you home to be with me? Did you? Amen. What did you do with this Jesus in your life? Yet they still didn't believe. The great news today is that you and I know those folks are wrong. Hello? Because the teaching of Jesus in the Bible, the evidence of the empty tomb, the crucifixion, says otherwise. This Jesus is the Son of God. This Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the one to come, our Savior, the Lord of heaven and earth. Amen. With the advantage of hindsight, you and I can look back from reading God's word in the Bible and see that many facts that even these religious people, not the, only the religious, but the non-believers in Christ, could have missed in their day. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1 through 3, for example, this is where we begin really to look and see what Jesus says you can only unmatch. Chapters 1 through 3, for example, we see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Somebody say God created the heavens and the earth. Created heavens and the earth. Scripture tells us that. The word tells us that God created all truth is based on that singular truth. God created. All reality is based on that reality. God created. Our entire faith in Christianity is built on that foundation that God created. That is, there is a God. And so there is a place where God exists. In other words, there's a heaven because there is God. And the heaven of God is his throne. Somebody say amen. Amen. I was drawn to reread Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You have your Bibles open, open it up there for me. Read along with me. Again, I say take my word for nothing, take God's word for everything. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning. Somebody say that with me. In the beginning. The earliest moment that man can comprehend, God was creating the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. Now, think with me here. If God was creating the heavens and the earth, the heavens being the sky and the space above the skies, this space of God in his dwelling place already existed, doesn't it? Huh? Listen, in the beginning, God created. Those very words says that God was already in existence. Your God is not a ex created being. Your God wasn't created by something else. He has been, will be, always has been, and always will be. He is the creator. He was not created. Amen. And then he says, there is a place where God dwells, in the heavens, which is his throne. God created, therefore God exists. God exists, therefore God has a dwelling, and the dwelling he calls heaven, his throne. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't know if you caught that. You did not too excited. Amen. I was wiggling in my seat at home. I was like, yeah, that's getting good. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. This is good. I know this, but now I really know this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Uh-oh. <laughs> God moved. God is not a thing. Amen. God is a living, living, breathing person. Hello? Amen. A living, breathing God. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. He's not a book. He's not the religious. Amen. God is a personality. Yes. God is a creator. And your Bible tells you 
He is your heavenly Father. He is the giver of life. He is the giver of all good things to those who love him. As I have shared with you many times when reading my Bible, I try to envision, to picture what I'm reading. And I pictured that this is where it all started. <laughs> the Spirit of God hovering over total chaos, total darkness. The chaos is nothing, meaning nothing has purpose. Nothing is in alignment. There's nothing under any type of control. And God came upon the scene. And he, in the spoken word, gained control. He, in the spoken word, stopped the chaos. He, in the spoken word, created a being. Creation. Put that thought in your mind. And then think from reading your scriptures. Something wonderful is about to happen. <laughs> Something wonderful is about to happen. Something was about to come out of nothing. The Spirit of God hovering like a hen hatching her chicks. God is about to have something wonderful, miraculous happen. <coughs> life begins. Somebody say life begins. Life begins. Life begins in the light. The Bible calls Jesus the light. The word, what? Is God. The word was God. The word is with God. And God himself calls Jesus the light of the world. Ooh, doggy, I'm getting something now. <laughs> this is making some sense to me now, Lord. <laughs> I gotta feel excited. I'm like, what? <laughs> now all of a sudden, Genesis makes sense. Why you had to tell us how the world and all of the creation was created? Now I understand why you put that in your word. In Genesis 1-3, somebody read it with me. Let there be light. Genesis 1 3, God spoke light into being. Wow. Scripture describes God as light. He is the source of the light that quickens our understanding. He is the source of the light that gives us teachings of His Word. His light is the example that we are to follow, it gives us a light unto our path. His Word is that light. You see? His power persuades us to follow after the light, which is good. God created this. He said it was good. God created that. He said it was good. God said, let there be this. He said it was good. God said, let us make man in, his, in our image after our likeness. And God said, it is good. Hello. God's first act of creation was to bring light into darkness. And as I read 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 9, that's where you go next. 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 9. The Lord shows us that he is still bringing light into the darkness. Hello? He has a greater purpose of doing so, but he's still creating that light into the darkness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. You have to say Amen. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is an awesome message. Not that the others aren't, but the Spirit of God really ministered to me because I was in, in a bad way after Pastor Ed said that. I'm looking to go to heaven and I'm worried about y'all. <laughs> you got your own lives to live. You're on your own after this. I'm gone. <laughs> right, wait a minute now. Slow your roll. <laughs> You're not going anywhere until I'm going. I'm going with you. <laughs> 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 9 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, which means we have heard of Jesus. And we declare his word to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, then we lie. We do not even know the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. In the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son cleanses us from all sin. Somebody say, from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, meaning acknowledge unto God that we are a sinner, that we have sinned, then He is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
You see, this is where we see today that Jesus and his father, he has been doing the same from the very beginning to even to today. He is the light into the darkness. Somebody say amen. amen. He's the light in your darkness. Some people say, well, I, 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 I got to get my life together. I got to stop smoking. I got to stop swearing. I got to stop getting hot. I got to stop doing this. I got to stop doing that. There's too many things I got to stop before I put my foot in the church because that church group is going to crane in on me. But I'm just so far gone, I ain't even in the ballpark to play baseball. You understand? I'm not even in the park. I got so much to do before I can step into church and give my life to God. I want to know what Bible you're reading. I want to know what ministry you heard that from. You know, I'm going to tell you my Bible says, God loved me while I was yet a sinner. My Bible said that he didn't come for the righteous, he came for the unrighteous. My God said that he died for the sinner, not for those self-righteous religious people. Hello? My God says, you come to my house as a hospital and I will make you whole. Because you're sick and lost in your sin that's going to cause you death. That's what my Bible said. Show me where in the Bible that you've got to clean yourself up. That you've got to get your, earn, earn your way into heaven. That you've got to get yourself there. I don't see that in my word. Hello? I don't see it and I don't believe it. I can't do anything to get to heaven. Jesus did it all for me. It's a gift, not something to be earned, not something to be gained by your good deeds. You see, if you think that it's all your goodness to get you to heaven, then you just trampled the blood of Jesus, his crucifix under your feet and counted as worthless, nothing. You see, people say, oh, I do this, I do that. I can't go to church, I feel guilty today. I was going to go, but then I did this last night, now I can't get myself to go because now I got so much guilt on me that I feel like I can't go. The Peter pastor is going to know something. See, he's anointed a God, he's going to, God's going to tell on me. He's going to embarrass me. See? I'm not going to church because you know that man, he know God. He got that a lot. <laughs> I'm talking to Pastor Ed because God tells him stuff. God's going to embarrass me. God's going to pull me out of the crowd and embarrass me. God never forces himself on anyone. And he will not manipulate you to love him to be obedient. Somebody say that. God will not manipulate. I don't hear you. They don't hear you. God will not manipulate to gain your love. You see? God did everything already to show you that he loves you and that you are in need of him, a Lord and a Savior. Somebody say amen. amen. On the second day, what did God do? Genesis chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. What did God do on the second day? Genesis chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. And God made the firmament, and he divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. As we read later in Genesis chapter 1, 9 through 25, God spoke the existence of the water separated from the land, the lights to guide the day and the nights, the sun and the moon into existence, the waters to be filled with living creatures, the birds flying above the earth, the land producing creatures after their own kind, and that all kinds of creatures, wildlife and wild livestock, after their own kind. And God saw it was good. <laughs> Somebody say, God saw it was good. Now I'll pause here because I get asked many times, will there be animals in heaven? That was another question. The Lord put all these questions from people I work with, people I've come in contact with, something that someone has said, and put this word for you and I together. So this apparently wants someone to be answered. You're asking, will I have my animals in heaven? And this is God's answer to you. Our Bible says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 through 8, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. I often visit the small pond area, which I told you about at the old farmhouse where I used to live. And on any given day, when nice outside, you can look out upon the calm water and see the glistening of the sun shining off the water, fresh summer breeze blowing across your face. Hear the birds chirping, the wildflowers blowing in the wind. Possibly see a deer grazing with a groundhog not as 
up so far from the distance. And I just feel how it might be when we get to heaven. But all that beauty, all that calm, all that my eyes can see, God promises in his word, is going to be a thousand times over and over better. Amen? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 through 8. When we look back at how it was in the very beginning, we can picture seeing the way it will be for us in the afterlife. With God in heaven, in the Garden of Eden, everything was beautiful. The colors were so much more vibrant than what you see today. I looked upon the wildflowers in the field and up on the backside and the greenery that was so fresh in the spring. I saw the color. I, I said to God out loud, God, you have such a beautiful paintbrush. <laughs> you paint this earth so beautiful. And you know what he said to me? Wait till you see heaven. <laughs> That's what he said. Wait till you see heaven. It's a thousand times more colorful, more bright, more peace, more the breeze that brushes across your face. It's the presence of God, the angel's wings ushering in the breath of life past your face. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding. No war, no sorrow, no sickness, no disease, no bickering, no hardship, no anxiety, no stress. Just peace and love. And you think, wow, man, you must have lived in the 60s talking about something like that kind of love. Peace and love, man. Peace and love. No, I'm not talking like that. I'm talking about what the God's describing. If you can only imagine. Hello? Mercy me. <laughs> Very fitting name for a group that sang that song. Mercy me. I can only imagine. You see, there will be beauty. There will be wonder. I can only imagine. Yet God gives us a glimpse throughout his word that we can look back and see what it originally was and what it will be when you and I are in heaven. Somebody say amen. Amen. You see, when you say amen, I know you heard this. I know you got this. God has done a really good job up in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 12. Wouldn't you agree? I just described everything he did up in Genesis chapter 1 through 12. And he did a good job. And God said, everything is good that he created. Hello? Everything was perfect. Everything was doing what it was supposed to be doing. But something was missing. Up to Genesis chapter 1 verse 12. Something was missing. Somebody look to me and read Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Read it with me out loud. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. When you say amen, I know you're there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Read it aloud with me so the viewers can hear you. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creepy thing that creeps upon the earth. You see, before the fall of man, this was God's purpose for you and I, to rule. Somebody say, to rule. That was God's purpose. God created you and I to rule over all the creation that he had made. And it's not temporary. God didn't create you to rule temporarily. God created you to rule for eternity, you see. You and I, mankind, mankind are made in God's image. This was not said about any other created thing of which God created. I believe God put these words on paper for all generations and they're out there to see and remember that you are of high value. You are the most precious of God. You're the apple of his eye. You're his heart, you see. You are made after his image, after his likeness. And all heaven and earth really, really are jealous of that fact. All of creation loves God's creation. And they love him. But they're jealous for you. The angels are jealous for you. They want to be you. They want to be having what you have. The intimacy that you have with the Creator. How do I know that? What did Lucifer do? Why did he have a problem? Why did he fight against God? Because he wants what God has. And God has you. Somebody say amen. Amen. We are to be more than just the animals that chases after our desires. We are to be more like God in so many ways. 
Because we are like him in so many ways. God is the creator. We are meant to be created. We know how to love instinctively. We're created to love. Not simply to have intimacy as in a sexual nature, but to love. To really love with your heart. That is the ultimate expression of love, the sexual nature. I love you, therefore I'm giving myself to you. Nobody else can share this intimacy that you and I have. This sexual encounter determines and dictates and formulates the idea of what God says love is. And the second idea of the sexual nature is to appropriate to the world offspring. You see? Foremost is the expression of your ultimate love. Second is to fulfill the promise, the purpose of God, that you would have a future, that mankind would have a future. Hello? God is love, and therefore we are made to be an extension of his love for you to say, what's my purpose in life? You just heard First 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. Scripture also teaches that God is holy, he's gracious, he's wise, he's existing in eternal fellowship. When God put that in my spirit, I, I never had it said it that way before. And I asked God, God, what do you mean eternal fellowship? What does that mean? It means that God is endless, and he wants an endless relationship with you and me. Hello? There is no beginning of God and no ending of God. And God has made us to be these things. We have no ending. You understand that, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, your body will end. Your body will die and go to the grave and it will decay. But you, the person living in that body, is no end. God created you in essence a part of himself. He breathed the essence of life into you. He is life. So a part of him dwells with on the inside of you in your spiritual realm. You are a spirit being as God is a spirit being. Yes, you have the flesh of a person, the outer core of who you are, shows me a person that I can have tangible evidence of your existence. I see you. Some of you I can smell. <laughs> I can touch you. I can hear you. Huh? <clears throat> Some of you I taste. My wife tastes wonderful when she shouts. Huh? You have to understand something. You are a spirit being. Clothed in the flesh. You are spirit first, clothed in the flesh. How do I know that? Your Bible, my Bible says, if you've got the King James Version, it says, God knew you and before you were placed in your mother's womb. Oh, so I was in heaven, I, I had this. Who do you look like? Your mom and your daddy. Who did you look like in heaven? After God's image, after his likeness. Hello? To have eternal fellowship with God means to share and participation of. To have a communion of oneness and intimacy as a knowing and mutual heartfelt relationship. Like-mindedness. A communal fellowship. Oneness. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden had a oneness relationship with God. He walked with them in the cool breeze of the day. In the cool of the evening. God had a relationship. A tangible relationship. And it was never meant to end. Hello? These are the areas that separate us from the other created creatures. We are God has a purpose, a plan, a future for us where he has a relationship, eternal relationship with us. God created us to be eternal with him and to rule the creation. Man's assignment to rule other creatures is a stewardship, simply meaning a guardian, a caregiver who has been given authority that was never meant to be abused or end. Hello? Just as we're given responsibility here on earth, we'll be given responsibility in heaven. Can you only imagine? Can you only imagine? This was God's original plan. The purpose for our creation by our creator was to rule with him, to have a relationship with him that will never end. I said all this to say that by looking at what God has created, you and I can begin to see God's intention as the designer of your life. He's preparing you to come into the image and the likeness of his son that you can come into the glory of heaven and he can look at you one day and he said, behold, I am well pleased. Enter into your rest. Hello? Wow, oh, it got quiet in here. I must have really set your mind swirling. 
I love watching Animal Planet documentaries of nature on TV. And I've learned by watching these and spending time in nature walks and hunting that every creature is designed for its environment. And I've even seen and caused an animal to struggle, to fight against or frail to thrive if it was taken from its original setting or I shot it and it didn't immediately die. I saw the dove struggling to catch his breath and try to fight so hard to stay alive. It's its natural, instinctive thing to do to fight to stay alive because you were never meant to die. Your body, we in the health field, see bodies struggling, trying to hold on to the very last breath, struggling and fighting not to let go of the body. And many of them do that because they don't know where they're going. It's still dark to them. They won't allow light in, you see. When Jesus, the light comes, your scripture, my scripture says in the book of Psalms, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For why? For thou art with me. You see, you were never meant to die. You were never meant to struggle to stay alive so hard that your body is ex existing only on your will to survive. But God has already proclaimed that we will have a day that will come to an end. God has not made us to be temporary beings. We were meant to be alive for eternity. If you haven't caught on, let me plainly say this. You and I are still created as eternal beings. We are made in the image of God after his likeness. We may have our bodies die and decay, but you and I are eternal beings that will live with our creator and fulfill our original purpose with him in a place beyond what we can imagine. Did you catch that? God has brought his son into the world that all things be restored as they originally were meant to be. And that includes you and me. Amen. He has cleansed the curse of sin from you and me, the heart that has received his son. Amen. He has made right what was went wrong by our sin, by our rejection of his word. And God said, now you have life abiding on the inside of you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. You have purpose, you have plan, you have a future. Because you have the truth living within you. You have life because you have the truth living in you. You have life because the blood of the Lamb has sacrificed his own for you. You have life in you because he has given you life. No more death can be found in you. You will rise again. Amen. Amen. I don't hear anybody. <laughs> yeah, I don't hear that. God wants to hear that. By looking back at what God originally wanted, what God said was good. <laughs> I got a glimpse of what God foretells, what you and I are going to see when we stand before him face to face. I see a place, it's called heaven. I see Jesus. He's said, this is home. Welcome into your rest. No more struggle, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more sickness, no more disease. Hello? Amen. I looked again to the Garden of Eden in scripture. And I think I understand what I now can see. Maybe five things Five things that I saw might help you get a vision of what it will be like in heaven for you. Real quick, we're almost done. It's not going to take long to get through this part. I first saw that Adam and Eve got into trouble for doing something. <laughs> that thing. I'm always in trouble for doing something. Oh, well, Lord, that's interesting. Well, what did they get in trouble for? Adam and Eve got in trouble for not obeying the word of God. They ate something that would rob them from the presence of God. He said, for the day you eat of this, huh? you shall what? Surely die. What is this thing die? Adam must have been thinking. He was like, what's he mean by that? What's that mean? Die. What do you mean you're going to die? The day you eat of it, you will be separated from life. You see? I'll take us off course for a minute and turn our Bible to Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 through 12. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 through 12. Matthew 8, 11 through 12. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob into the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer, outer darkness. There shall, be weep, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 2.7, last 
Last book in the Bible, Revelation 2, 7 says, He that has an ear, let him hear. Listen now. What the Spirit says unto the churches. <clears throat> to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. To him that overcomes, I will give the, of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. You see, to those who overcome the darkness, the evil in this world, we are promised the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Huh? When God is in this mess in the first place, we ate of the forbidden fruit, the tree of death and evil. Now God said, we're going to eat of the tree of life, the tree of good, the tree of eternal life. We can see that in John also wrote in Revelation 19.9, he said, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Hello? So I take this to see in heaven that we'll be at an awesome feast. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I love to eat. <laughs> Pastor Evan, I love my steak. Don't mess with my steak now. You make it good, you make it right. I'm going to enjoy this. I love steak. Of all the food that God gave me, I love steak. And I asked God one time, throwing a little kicker in there, God, is there going to be beef that I can eat in heaven? I asked Pastor Ed that. He said, I really don't know because there's no bloodshed in heaven. And then I asked another guy, George Meese, I said, is there going to be beef in heaven? I love steak last time we had steak. He said, well, he said, if not, look at it this way. You love the taste? Doesn't matter what it looks like, God's going to give you the taste that you desire. He gives you the desires of your heart. Yes, I'm in. I'm going. I'm catching that train. Hello? <laughs> Glad you laughed. Some of them didn't. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. God rested on the seventh day. So we'll eat. We'll have a great feast. We'll be a great celebration. And Genesis 2, 2 says that God rested on the seventh day. And so you and I will have a time of rest. Somebody say amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 through 12 says, There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. I underline that in my Bible. A rest to the people of God. For that he is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from all his hard work, for as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, which means strive for, do what is right, follow the word and obedience of Christ, that you will enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder, soul, and spirit. And of the joints in the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So did you catch verse 11? Let us labor, therefore, into that rest. Lest any man fall at the example of unbelief. I noticed something here, and I hope to show you something as well. God says that we need to labor to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall at the example of unbelief. Therefore, to be in faith is to be at rest. Hello? To be at faith is to be at rest. I'll say it again. Some of you are getting it. Some of you are like, huh? To be in faith is to be at rest. Hello? You see, God had finished his work. He had been doing it. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy. Because of the day, he rested from creating all that was done. Not because he was tired. <laughs> you know, when we get tired, we rest. That isn't why God rested. He rested because he was finished. Hello? All our labors that we have worked through, the thriving to survive, the struggling to maintain the promises of God, all the times of walking in faith, overcoming the evil one, God tells his children to enter into your rest. Whoa, now it makes sense. <laughs> in heaven, there's going to be a celebration. In heaven, I don't have to struggle. I'm going to rest. I'm going to enjoy salvation. The joy of my salvation will be even now ten times, thousand times greater than what I have now. Jason said, I'm so excited. I have a new zeal for life. I'm excited. There's a joy in my spirit. God says ten thousand times greater when you experience that joy in the presence of the king. There remains then a Sabbath rest for God speak. Anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, their labors, just as God did his. We will find rest in heaven. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, our Bible tells us that God created man with a physical body. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. From the beginning, 
man had a dual nature. Dual meaning consisting of two parts, a physical nature and a spiritual nature. The physical nature, as I expressed a little earlier, is the outer part of you that I can see. I can smell, touch, hear, see, feel. The spirit of man is the spirit of man is spiritual. That spirit part of man, which is made in God's image, where I cannot see. The physical part was made from the dust of the earth. The spirit was made from the essence of God, the very breath of God. If you've ever entered or attended a funeral service that I have officiated, then you have heard my words say these. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. But the spirit returns unto the Lord by whom that person was created. Both parts are good because God said both parts are good. He made man in his image after his likeness and it was good. Both parts are necessary to complete the definition of what it is to be man, mankind. From the beginning God wanted man to have a spirit and a body. And so there will also be a body in the life to come. People say, well, am I going to know the people that I go to heaven and I get to see them? Am I going to know my mom, my dad, my grandparents, and all those that are going to heaven? If they're in heaven, you will know them. You'll recognize them. This is a fact based on scripture. I won't read them all, but for you note takers, I'll ask you to jot them down so you can read them when you get home. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Job chapter 19, verse 25 through 27. Job 19, 25 through 27. And 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and 4. If you didn't get those, see me after. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 4. But I will read you this one. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. It reads, For our citizenship is in the heavens, where also we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who shall transform our humble body of our conformed being to conform that to Jesus as a glorified body, according to the working of his power, that he enables him to be subject in all things to himself. In other words, you're going to get a brand new body. One without scar, aches, sorrow, pains, the scars of life, the sickness and disease, the broken limb, the limb that's no longer existing, the blind eyes, and will be no more. You will get a glorified body, a brand new body. Now, I don't know about you, but that seals the promise for me. <laughs> I'll have a glorious body just like Jesus does. The title again for today's message is What I Have Seen. I Can Only Imagine. Amen? I Can Only Imagine. As I was studying this week, that song, I Can Only Imagine, came on that radio as I shared with you. And I knew then what the message was going to be this morning. Our five senses, touch, see, smell, hear, and taste, are all very important attributes that God created us with them. And he said it is good. What will we be able to touch in heaven? What will we be able to see, to smell, to hear, to taste in heaven? The senses that God has given man is so very important. And unfortunately, while in this life some have lost some of those senses, or even more than one. But in heaven, all will be restored. It is a proven fact that the touch is extremely important in the early stages of birth. Babies thrive on being touched. Think about it. How important is it for you to even hold the baby in your arms, to see them, to smell them, even to hear their laughter, laughter, their whimper, their cues, their crying? Some people even love to kiss their feet. What? Not me. I tell you, I'm ankles enough. I'm good. I don't touch feet. Tasting and clean their feet with their lips and their mouth. Blech! No. Jesus was always touching people. In the Gospel of Matthew alone, he touched a leper, a woman with fever, a dead girl, a drowning disciple, doubting Peter, little children, and two blind men. People desired and touched him as well. Even after he was resurrected, he was touched by people. Thomas touched him. When we imagine a heaven filled with bodiless spirits, we create an empty place. There's no one going to be there but spirit beings. We can't touch them. We can't stop the smell of them. We can't hear them. We can't taste them. It's just empty. Heaven without senses would be contrary of how God created us. And that all we have said according to his word will not be true. You see, we will have bodies restored. Heavenly bodies, but not angel bodies. 
No bodies that are acting as ghosts, but you'll have a new body before the curse. It's going to look brand new before the physical death. Being safe in the presence of our Creator in the arms of Jesus is how I view heaven. I believe that I will have a glorified body, a body that one day I will experience heaven with all my senses very much alive. So in closing, I'm going to ask you to stand up and sing you a lot. I'm going to ask you to only imagine what it will be when you enter into heaven and stand before a living God. I imagine with the sense of sight, I'm going to see God in all his glory. I will experience with all my being just as God originally created me. I'm going to have a relationship, a visual, a tangible deal for God. I will have him hold my hand and I'll feel the touch of his hand. I'll have him verbally speak into my ear. I will really hear him with my ear. Our sight is so limited now. Our eyes are incapable of seeing many things that are in this world. I don't know if you all know this about me, but I, I am colorblinded through a shade. They call it shaded colorblind. I know this is blue. I know this is blue. But I only know this is blue because my wife told me so. I see it as black. It's navy blue, she said. I see the blues. So this is, as the variant colors change, I do not see a light blue, a lighter blue, a lighter blue, a lighter blue. I know blue, I know white, I know pink, I know gray, I know white, I know blue gray. See the shade there? I don't know. I know green and deep. I can tell color, if you shade it, I cannot see it. In heaven, there's no variance of shade. There's no variance, which means there's no change. There's no slight difference in God's love for you. And he will open your eyes to see his love as he is love. Amen? I will experience all of what God created me to be. I can only see, I can only imagine how the light will be exposed and it will get away from all the darkness, but there's no darkness in heaven. Perhaps when you and I get into heaven, the splendor of God's majesty with all our eyes will hear and see the thunder of heaven, the voice of God, the loving voice that I will hear, the gentle but strong hand that takes mine in his, the heartbeat of God as my head rests upon his chest and say, wow, Lord, I am you home as I'm hugging him as he greeting me. The smellness of the freshness of the purity and the holiness of heaven, the cleansliness of heaven, and God hearing and say, it is good. Oh my. And I will feel, you will feel, not with blood-stained hands from evil doings, but with washed, cleansed, and free hands, the love that God has for you and me. Amen. Amen. And as Jesus escorts us to the throne of the Father, my creator, your creator, all of heaven will be rejoicing and celebrating that you made home. And God will look to you and he'll say, welcome, enter into your rest. I am well pleased. Amen. Let's give God some praise this morning. Jesus loved me. Yes, I know. For my Bible tells me so, little ones to Him belong. Oh, we are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. My Bible tells me so. Now remind one another that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you, this I know, for my Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, you are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves you, yes, Jesus loves you, yes, Jesus loves you, my Bible tells me so. Amen. Love you guys. I'll see you next week. We're going out to eat to celebrate Jan's birthday, so whoever wants to go with us, just hang out. We'll tell you where we go. Amen.